Well, I'm extremely encouraged to be here, and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else if I had free tickets to a ball game or, or free tickets to something. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else than right here tonight, because this is the will of God for me. Amen. And it's good to be in the will of God. I was asked by a leader overseas in Africa, he said, what brings you to Africa? And he was saying something about maybe the fear coming over there, or whatever it was, and I said, I said, I am safer over there in the will of God Amen. than being back here around all my family and everything gathered around me out of His will. See, as Jesus walked this earth, He constantly had people saying, save your life. Save your life. You don't have to go to the cross. People all over the place was telling me, you can't go to Africa. There's diseases and they, uh, USA's uh, travel advisory and all these things. And I had people tell me, someone in my family, I've shared this before, said, don't come and see me two weeks after you get back. Wait two weeks before you get back. God, people tell me this is, save your life, Clint. You don't have to go over there. You can serve the Lord here. I must go where He's leading you to go. I must go. You follow Him. Follow Him fully. Yeah, the Lord showed me that one day I was carrying my cares in, into work or into the church on Wednesday night. You know how we are? You know how we act, though. I act and I, how are you going to help? Going great. <laughs> Inside you're carrying a bunch of cares. And the preacher let on that song. And I had sang that song for years. But it never meant anything until the Holy Spirit breathed revelation on it insight I got it I realized that I've been looking the Lord on Sunday but all week I was down here <laughs> all unrestful unrest unrest as I you know I'd go back to church and I'd get my eyes on him then the other six days I'd be down here and then when he come out of that song the Holy Spirit showed me look full is one not half not half full Turn your eyes, that's our problem. We need to turn our eyes and look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. I was losing my job. You know, I was losing my job. Things were going south, so to speak. I was casting my care, didn't know what I was going to do, didn't, didn't know what was going on. And so I was worried. I, I was concerned about that. But the Lord spoke and said, Turn uh, and look full in my wonderful face. And it's strange. I was burdened when I went into that service, but when I came out after being readjusted by the Lord, the Holy Spirit, looking full in His wonderful face, the thing, my situation had not changed. What had changed? My heart focus is what changed. My direction, my eyes looking unto Jesus, taking your gaze off one thing, putting it on another. You're never going to see me here preach on cults. You're never going to hear preach on many subjects out here. Paul was very narrow-minded. He said, I preach Christ and Him crucified. There is nothing else. Preaching Christ. Preaching Christ. Preach the gospel in season and out of season. It's always in season. Hunting. Uh, rabbits only in season over here. Deer season. You know, you can only hunt certain times and it goes out. But preaching the gospel is all seasons. Preaching Christ. We want entertain many times and all the stuff. The world's pretty good at what it does. Very good at getting our attention off of Jesus. What He wants to do is change you and me. He wants to conform us. Thank you for your words tonight, both you, you know, all you ministries here. But thank you that it's Jesus changing our lives, being conformed to His image. That's the goal. That's why He saved us. And He does want, that's His heart tonight. I want to work through my vessel. I want to make you like myself. But you're not going to do that focused on all the stuff over here. As you behold Jesus, you are changed from glory to glory by the Spirit of God. Not beholding this other stuff here. You know, it, it, the world does very good, very successful in getting our attention on all this stuff out here. The Lord said this life's full of trouble. He said, he said take heart. In me, you're going to overcome. Your, uh, your focus is on the, beyond my, me. Nehemiah, when he was building the wall in chapter 4 of Nehemiah, the enemies didn't show up until the wall starts to be built. <laughs> the wall starts to be built, the enemies are right there. And it's very interesting, 
And I think somewhere in Ezra there, I think they were very successful in this, the opposition. When God begins to move, build, the enemy shows up, and two things the enemy came. One thing is, he says, uh, he says, are you going to revive the stones that you guys, you know, broke down? He's trying to get them to focus on their past. That's what the enemy tries to do to you. Focus on your past. How can you be used by how can you be used by God? You've done this and you've committed this as a teenager. How did you do this? You know, he paralyzed them. I think at one time, I think the work even stopped there for a time. The enemy is very successful in getting you to focus on your past. Twofold. The one thing they, they got them to focus on their past, and the other thing was that they got them, will you do this? Will you fortify this? Will you rebuild this? Will you? He wants you to focus. He, the enemy tries to get you to focus on you. He's very successful in that. But no, in Nehemiah, he caught that in that first chapter, or fourth chapter there, I think it was verse four, whatever it says, Hero Lord, you know, he had his, he's the leader there. As a leader's servant, we are to be pointing people to Jesus, allowing them to be changed and following Him. The focus is Christ. That, that's the image we put up. You know, beholding Christ, following Him, following Him fully. There, Paul is narrow-minded. You're narrow-minded. What are you preaching on, Paul? Christ. Christ. There is nothing else. In Him crucified. Obeying Him, following Him. And it's... Uh, Many times we want to entertain, even at the jail, you know, guys play the guitar down in Allegheny County, and sometimes we even stop and say, hey, you know, this isn't, you know, it's nice that you're, you know, you like the music, but this is to bring you into a worship. I believe tonight, as much as any that I've ever been here, tonight, with both you, you know, I believe you sensed that. I mean, it was really, it, it got our hearts focused towards the Lord, and not knocking any other night, don't, don't go there. But it really gets us focused towards Him, prepares the, 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 the word for the or the heart for the words coming out. Amen. But following Him, focus on Him. But it's, you know, we stop the music and say, you know what, guys, close your eyes, focus on the Lord. You know, focus on the Lord. We like to entertain. I told you I went to a church, a pastor I loved, and one summer he tried to get people out, and he said, I'm going to preach on, you know, here. He says, I'm going to have super. Uh, Sunday nights. I'm not condemning that. I'm just saying what I see now. And every every Sunday night throughout the summer, he was trying to get people in the church. And you know, so a quartet would come in, a trio would come in, and after the year was up, he, he, for the next year, uh, let's do it again. And I said, you know, I said, what'd you think? I said, what I think was all flesh. I think it was all flesh. I believe we are to preach this gospel. And I'm not saying you can't have a quartet and sing. But if you know what I'm saying, preach the gospel. In season, out of season. It's Christ. The preaching is foolishness to the, to the natural man. But you keep preaching. You keep preaching and hopefully there will be a, a uh, receiving on the other end, a, a hearkening to that word. And He will build you. See, the building project, and you've got to... Nehemiah, when the building project was going up there... He had one time, the enemies were there, he had a, a, a tool in one hand, a trowel, and a spear in the other hand, and you know, they had a, a sword on their side, you know, from morning to night, from morning to night, they, they were, they were, they were, had their weaponry ready, you know, but they were building, building, you know, the, the focus, they were 24-7, there's no time to take a break, there's no time to let down your guard, 24-7, you are to be watching, keep your heart with all diligence, it's a full-time job. Keep your heart with all diligence, for that's the real issues in life. It's a matter of life and death, Christian. You know, many Christians die along the way. I didn't say going to hell. They die along the way. The way of sin is death. Continue in the way. Continue in the narrow way that leads to life. Leads to life. I don't know whether they still do it. When you go to the bank, uh, when you get a bank job, maybe a teller, they, they, they teach and train them what a, the real genuine bill the, one, the, the genuine, the bill, you know, what to look for. If you know the genuine, you'll, you'll know error. I don't have to study error. I don't have to study the defense. You, you know Christ and you follow Him and you're obedient to Him, you'll, you'll recognize error. You'll see it. But it's, it's like a, a Dan Faust. You know, sometimes I use these, these examples that young, young guys don't know, but this day it might be Tom Brady. Uh, I guess that's the quarterback, but I don't watch football either, but but years ago, Dan Fouts had to win games 44 to 38, 48, 
They had no defense. The only way they won if the offense stayed on the, on the field. Stay on it offensively. You know, don't start backing up, knocking down the gates of hell. You're not backing up. You're pressing in. You're knocking down the gates of hell. You're not on the defense. You're moving on in Him. Following Him. Pressing into Him. I don't know any other gospel. Paul says, I'm preaching Christ. Christ and be conformed to His image. This is the gospel. All this stuff is always going to be trouble. Always going to be problems out there. The world trying to lure you in. I'm not giving any attention to it. I'll keep my eyes on Him. The world loves to get you uh, focused on all this stuff out here that's meaningless. Emptiness. But we need to keep our eyes and our hearts focused on looking unto Jesus. It means to take you on Hebrews. They had to focus on angels. They had to focus on all these things. They quit going to church. And, and you know, he said, we consider, consider Him looking unto Jesus. We see Jesus. It is so easy to get our heart focused on all the stuff out here. Pay attention. What's, what's He doing in our hearts? Pay attention. You want to be a vessel used by God? A lot, you're going to pay attention to what's going on here. He wants to make you. He wants to mold and shape you. You're the work. You're the work. And as He works in you, He'll work through you. He'll work through you. So it's preaching Christ. You know, that's... You know, people want me to preach on other things. I have one message, you know. Come to Christ, be birthed from above if you've never been saved. Come to Him, give your heart to Him. And be conformed to His image. I, I don't have any other message. Obey Him. All that's in there. I, I, I keep preaching about it. Keep obeying Him. Keep following Him. Keep loving Him, number one. And to the dying day, I'll keep preaching Christ. And keep following Him. Obey Him. But again, guard your heart against all this stuff that the world just loves you to give attention to. It's always going to be. It's going to get worse. I'm prophesying right now. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. It's not going to get better. People are trying to change the government thinking we're going to bring salvation through a man in the, in the White House. The problem's not the White House. The problem's God's house. We've left our first love. Preaching's not out there to try to change the government. Pray for them in all the authority, kings and all the authority, that you may lead a quiet and peaceful life. He desires that all men be saved. And we think we're praying to get the guy saved or in government. That may be there, but I don't see that in 1 Timothy 2. He says, pray for all those in government, all of them, that you may lead a quiet and peaceful life. He desires that all men come into his salvation. No matter who's in there. You know who, you know who puts, puts the man in the White House? You do know that, don't you? My little two-year-old granddaughter tells me that. <coughs> God does. Who made the sun, the moon, the stars? God does. Who made mommy and daddy? God does. Who makes a beautiful day out there? God does. Who puts a president in every four years? God does. Oh, we can learn from a child. To learn from a child. You know, don't get, don't get entangled with the affairs of this life. That's what, what Paul tells Timothy. Be a good soldier. Endure hardship as a good soldier. Don't get entangled. That word entangled means to be braided with the affairs of this life. It, it, don't get, you're, you're like a woman braiding her hair. Don't get involved in it. Get, I'd like to sing that song maybe again on higher ground. I want to live above the world. Above the world. Those Satan's darts be hurled me. I want to live above the world. That's where He's calling us to live in the heavenlies, to, to focus on things above, not on earthly things. Fall on Him. Fall on Him. Well, tonight, I want to talk about pride versus humility. I want to talk about unbrokenness versus brokenness. I, I, I believe I'm talking about one of the number one subjects in the Scriptures. You probably see that in every book of the Bible, pride. You know, I'm a teacher. <laughs> I, I do this. I go on missions trips. I do in pride come before fall. It is, it is uh, many things the Scripture talks about. We're going to look at tonight in Proverbs 6. 
There's a list there, Proverbs 6, I think, John 16 and 17. It says there are six things, no, seven things that are abomination to God. And the first thing on that list there, and I know sins are sin, the first things listed on there is haughty eyes. Then a lying tongue. Now, sin is sin, but it's not a coincidence that the writer there writes haughty eyes as number one. Haughty eyes. Thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought. And again, we see that through all the scriptures. It's what God Satan thrown out of heaven because he wanted to rise. He wanted to be as God. And even Adam, he wanted to see. He was tempted along the line of seeing as God sees. You see that in just about every book in the Bible. Pride. Better than now. And all I want to look at tonight, let's go to uh, John, or I'm sorry, James. The book of James. Book of James, chapter 4. James, chapter 4, there, verse 6. Start verse 6 down through 10. I'm in James 4, 6 through 10. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resist the proud. He resisteth the proud but gives grace to the humble. That word resisteth means to oppose. To oppose. <coughs> but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw near to you. And what I like in these last two verses here that I'm going to read, he gives you the remedy on how to draw near God. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Who's he talking to? This letter is written to Christians, scattered. The tribes were scattered abroad. Cleanse your hand, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Who's he talking about? People that are looking half all week long, and then they look full on Sunday to the Lord. And it half double-mindedness. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. How do you cleanse your hands, you sinners? How do you purify your heart, you double-minded? Well, when, a, when the Spirit of God convicts you, you confess it. 1 John 1, 9, if you confess, that's only your part. If you confess your sins, one of the greatest verses in the Bible, I believe. 1 John 1, 9. It's if. You don't have to. If you confess your sins, <clears throat> God will forgive you and cleanse you from all that's unright in you. From all that's unright. He's making you. He's cleansing you. He forgives you as you turn and repent and confess. I remember saying to my friend one time, I feel like I'm repenting all the time and confessing. He looked at me and said, you're growing. He said, you're growing. See, you're aware of your heart condition. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your heart, you double-minded. Not talking to the world. A worldly man can only be of one mind. Double-mindedness. Lot was double-minded. You know. That's why uh, God sent the prophet to Mount Carmel. How long are you going to be between two opinions? How long are you going to give yourself to this world? How long are you going to set your mind on things of the, on the earth? You're going to set your mind on things above, loving Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Jesus talking to his disciples, he said, guard yourself against the leaven of the Pharisees. Against the leaven. You know, leaven, making into, you, know, you, you use that in the making and baking and causes things to rise. And I believe not only the teaching of the Pharisees, guard yourself, Jesus is telling his own his disciples, guard yourself. You don't rise up in the teaching of, of the Pharisees, one of the uppermost seats, rising up, stay low, stay low. He says, beware. John the Baptist says, he must increase, but I must decrease. So, you know, the way up in God is down. You do know that kingdom principle. The way up in God is down. We won't buy the... Uh, Bible school teacher one time when he went to Bible school, he said, man, I tried to get up to where my teacher was. You know, 
I just didn't seem like I could connect with him. You know, he, I'm trying to go into Bible school, and you know, I just I didn't seem like I connected with him. After a couple of years sitting under the Word, he realized his teacher was down here. That's why he couldn't connect with him. Come, Jesus said. Where, where, where was he at? Physical location, right beside him. He said, come, take my yoke up, up on you, upon you, and learn of me. I am meek and lowly at heart. He, he wants you to draw near Him. Well, you think you just, okay, I just, I'm going to draw near you, Lord. No, oh, there's a, uh, you have to meet the conditions there. Cleanse your heart, you sinners. Purify you double-mindedness. Confess your sins. Repent. He stiff-arms the proud. What? He, he opposes the proud. The Christian, he opposes them. What do you mean? Wouldn't he love? Wouldn't he just say he wants them to come, but he can't. He opposes the proud because he acts against his nature. He desires that there be a humbleness, a brokenness, take place that you can draw near. You can't draw near him. He, his heart's open. But God hates pride. It's an abomination to him. It's against his nature, who he is. Beware means to look at, take heed, behold. How about the Elijah syndrome? I'm the only one who can teach that class. I'm the only one who can go on a missions trip or play the uh, musician. I'm the only one. The Elijah syndrome, a great man of God he was. But it seemed like he came to a place where, you know, he thought he was the only one left. There's a lot of Elijah syndromes. It's dangerous to be used by God thinking, I'm really somebody. I can teach. I can really do this. It's me. Uzziah thought he was really... God was blessing him. Everything he touched, God was touching him, blessing it. And it says, that until he became strong in himself. <laughs> and it says he thought he could do anything. He went into the temple and tried to burn incense. And some valiant priest ran in there and said, get out of here. And he said, who do you think you are? And he went to you know, do something to him. Whatever his, heart, his hand turned to leprosy. And he, he hurried himself out. He didn't need an escort. He was humbled there. God hates pride. He hates pride. He's trying to work in us. When we're born again, I believe just like we, you know, we all need to come down. James and John wanted to call fire down on them Samaritans. They're not receiving you. They're wicked over there. They're wicked over here. The Lord said, you don't know what spirit you're of. That's not my spirit. Moses knew he was called. He went out and started killing Egyptians. And God says, that's not my spirit. I'm going to send you on the backside of the desert. I need to bring you down. Every man of God that used in the Scriptures, he went through an Arabian desert. A desert. Because he loves us. He must take us through some tribulation. Take us through some things. Bring us down. We, you know, we need help getting down here. It's not natural to just go this way. <clears throat> Psalm says, it's been good I've been afflicted that I might learn your ways. It's been good I've been humiliated, humble. Mark, my flesh doesn't like to be humiliated, Fred. I got pulled over getting a ticket on the way to the airport. I had two people who weren't Christians in my car. And I got pulled over and a cop come up behind me and said, put your hands up on a wheel. Put my hands up on a wheel. And these guys behind me, I could hear them howling. This is 25 years. I could hear them laughing. Although they weren't saying a word. I was so humiliated. First thoughts I, I, I uh, came to my mind was, I hope nobody sees me. We're so proud. Oh, God. I'm, I'm preaching this to me tonight. We're so proud. Or you trip and fall. What's the first thing you do? Hope nobody saw me. We're so proud. He, he's going to work every, all things together to bring you down lower. He come back after giving me a ticket. He come back. He said, put your hands up on the wheel a second time. And I was just so humiliated. It was that word humiliated comes from a Latin word, and humus means dirt. He's trying to bring us down to the dirt. It's a good place. That's where he is. That's where the Lord is down here. I told you I was in the living room with some person here. They called me over, her and her husband. I was having problems. And she was saying how her family's always coming against her, against spiritual matters. And I said, well, I, I went up and I stood. I, I never did this before. I went up and shook her hands. Praise God. 
Blessed are you when all men speak evil of you. You know, we like to hear all good things. If, if everybody's telling you how good you are, you may, you may need to check your spiritual pulse to make sure you're falling on the right path. And you, you know, you understand what I'm saying. You know, you're living unto Him. Following Him. Land, not expecting anything back. You know this gospel is impossible. Apart from Him. You know that, don't you? Land, you gave me that book. You had $5 Every time I see you, you got that five, I see that five dollars on your forehead. I want that back. There was a guy that I'll share this story. He was a, he goes to church and made loaned a, a guy at work, maybe I don't know. He didn't say the amount, maybe four or five hundred dollars. And and uh, he I would give him twenty bucks here, twenty bucks there, a year passed, a year and a half passed, and you know, my buddy's wanting his money. God would throw him 20 orders. And then one year he had a birthday party. He invited all his friends and everything. And my police said, he's having a birthday party with my money. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, I want you to write him, get him a birthday card, write paid in full. And he, he wrote it, paid in full. He gave it to him and it released him. For him and his wife had some marital issues and she ran off with somebody else. She ran off with somebody else. I'll never forget this story. She ran off with somebody else, and he, he's living in the neighbor's house, and he's living in the neighbor's house, and it's winter time, and he, he sees somebody stuck in a driveway going down to his wife's house. And this is only the Holy Spirit can do these things. He tell him the story on himself, so to speak. He saw somebody stuck in his long country driveway, and he, he said, well, you have to know this guy's heart loves the Lord. He said, I'm going to hell. He put his boots on, and he went halfway down, and he went and he looked, and he saw who it was, and he said, oh, now here's a guy that's taking his wife. He's saying, there ain't no way in the world. He turns around, the Holy Spirit said, go help that man. <coughs> I mean, I can teach these things. You know, walking it out is a different story. He went and helped him out. That name, the... That guy ended up getting saved before he died. That guy that... Uh, I mean, this gospel, it's... its With man, it's impossible. I was teaching about forgiveness. I come out of the class one time, and a guy said to me, he said, you know what you're teaching is impossible. And I looked at him, I think he... I shocked him, I said, you're exactly right. I know that. What I'm teaching is impossible. But with God, with God, all things are possible. With Him. Not in yourself. You got someone's got your back. <laughs> when you're with him and he's with you. When he's the Lord's on my side, what can man do to me? He's on my side. Make sure you're on his side. Stay low. He's, he's telling the disciples, don't rise up. Don't think you're somebody more highly than you, than you want. Isaiah 57 says, God says, I. I am high and lofty. I'm the, I'm the high and holy one. God says this. That's his address. He's high and holy. Isaiah 57. He said, I am high and holy. And yet he said, there's another address he dwells. He said, but I, I also dwell with those who are contrite and broken heart. That's where I dwell. He's got two addresses here. The high and holy one, and yet he comes down. Come down. Another place it says, uh, the earth, the, uh, the heavens are my throne, God says. The earth is my footstool. The whole earth is God's little, is footstool. Say you have a footstool right out in front here, you know, in your living room. The whole earth is that footstool. And yet to this man I will look, or this woman, he's had a broken heart, a contrite spirit. You know, Lord, I, I need you. I, I need you. I need you. I told you what we went through in the last couple of years. I, I, I never realized you could come to a, a desperation like that. But still, there's times, there's times, it's still this, this, maybe Abraham went through it. It says a, a horror of darkness comes over him. Wants to settle over him. It said a horror of darkness. And sometimes I think what we went through, sometimes I get my focus, I'm like you. Sometimes I think about what all, you know, what we went through. And it, there, this horror of darkness wants to settle on me. And I, I look to the Lord and it, it, it goes. You know, it goes, but just, if I'm focused on a situation, and I focus on it, I, the horror of darkness, it's, 
I'm just telling you, I'm being honest. This wants to settle down over me, and I have to fight through that. Fight the good fight of faith. Not against something out there. From your heart getting entangled, from all this stuff out here. But looking unto Him. I'm, we're no spiritual giants. We went through some tough things, but the Lord is, is amazing. My wife went out with someone today, and she just couldn't believe how she's seen my wife function in some of these areas. My, my son-in-law got married again, and they had a shower, and they asked my wife to make uh, some things, and she made it and everything, and she walks into church, and one of the ladies said, I can't believe you're here. Now, my daughter that went to be with the Lord, you know, uh, you know, he married a wonderful woman from the church, 47 years old, never been married. All of God, my, my daughter even told, told, told all of us, you know, I, I want you to raise my kids if anything happens to me. She told uh, this girl. So Brenda walks into the shower there, and I said, you're a testimony, even you walking in that place. You're a testimony of God's goodness. We're not functioning in our own, own self. I don't have the strength to go through this life, and I hope the sooner you know you don't have the strength, the better it is. You do not have the strength to go through this life, but He does. And He is rich and full of mercy. He's an ever-ready battery. He's constantly ready to give. But we have those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The word renew means to exchange. You, you bring your weakness, your despair. Lord, I need help. They said, you've come to the right place. Young men grow we faint and weary, but <laughs> no matter how strong the young man is, they, they grow weary. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall walk and not be weary. They'll run and not faint. Because you're functioning in a supernatural move in God. It's Him. Him we need. Not to get to heaven. To get through this life. <laughs> you know, you understand, I'm talking to Christians tonight. Brokenness is having my way broke. Shattering my will that His will is established. Hebrews, it says in Hebrews, a wonderful verse the Lord showed me a couple years ago. He takes away the first that He may establish the second. And what that Holy Spirit showed me is he takes away, He works to take away my will in this life. That I'm not living for me. That He establishes His will in my life. So He, like a stallion, a wild stallion needs broke. It needs tamed. It's untrainable. You know, wild horses, you're going to see them being trained in, in the wild. You know, maybe on an old, old show or whatever. They're trying to tame them. They're trying to teach, so that they'll come unto the orders of the, the rider. We're like a, a wild ass, the scripture says. You know, we're, we're stubborn, stiff necked. We want to go our own way. Brenda and I went to horseback riding, and she made the mistake, and she was just honest. The guy says, Hey, how many of you ever rode any here any experienced riders? And she said, I did. And, you know, they gave her the most spirited horse, and that thing wandered the whole time. I'm there saying, Lord, this horse had a mind of its own. It wanted to just run its own, do its own thing. Well, you were like that as a Christian many times. We, our, our will broke, shattered, but we're fallen. Will, Jesus had a will too. Not my will, but your will be done. He loves us too much to leave us like our, our own self, the way we are. He wants to make us. He wants to mold and shape us. I like, uh, thanks Tony for sharing about David. We should look at my notes tonight. You know, because David, a, a heart after God. Now you look at King Saul and King David, from an outward standpoint, David committed grosser sins. He uh, slept with Bathsheba. He, he, uh, he tried to connive that way and try to, you know, lie and conniving and, and he couldn't do it. So he had, <laughs> had him killed, sent his own death orders with him. You know, he, he, he lied. He committed a lot. And Saul, you know, he, he had a he had sin of, sins of un, incomplete obedience. He'd only partially obey. No, sin is sin. But there's two kings, two different heart conditions. Saul was an unbridled uh, stallion. He was stiff. It started out real humble. Oh, man. But it can be dangerous to be used by God. God started using him, and he started out very good. But he started in his heart. He, 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 he wasn't guarding his heart. It led him to death. In the relationship I'm talking about, spiritual death. 
He said, there's that David who had envy and jealousy and tried to spear him to death. You know, he, he admitted he sinned. He admitted he sinned. But it didn't bring him to a place of brokenness, to a place where he says, Lord, he says, I'm needy. He says, make me look good in front of all the, the people, the elders. The, uh, the prophet Samuel came one time to him. He was building a monument uh, you know, in his own honor. That's not a broken man. That's a prideful man. A proud man wants everybody to look at me, look at me. David, for one year, he was, he was wild, so to speak. You know, he, he had that, that sin with Bathsheba, and the, the Holy Spirit was dealing with him, but he, he kept fighting it off. You read in Psalm 51, he, he kept fighting it off, and finally the, the Holy Spirit, in the form of Nathan, was sent there. And he said, you're the man, David. He said, yes, Lord, I'm the man. God's looking for Christians and say, it's not that the wife you gave me, or that neighbor you gave me, or that co-worker, or, or, or that family I was raised in, I didn't have my father, you know, it's me, I'm the man. David says, I'm the man. That's a broken roof off. Walls down. Roof off. He's open before God. Broken. Brokenness. He said, if those sacrifices, I'd give you all the sacrifices. But what you're wanting, Lord, is a broken, contrite heart. You're not going to despise. So he could draw near God. And God could draw near him. In this situation here. Two, two different contrasts. Prophets went to both of them. Nathan and Samuel went to both of them. But their heart response. They both sinned. But our, our heart response to it. Our heart response. I want to talk about uh, two brothers, uh, two people at a dinner tonight, and two that went to church. <laughs> they want to see where the one was broken, the other was unbroken. One was proud, the other one was humble. To see what's going on in this, this, this story here. Luke chapter 18. Let's go there. Start out there. Luke chapter 18. The story, you know, this is two that went to church. And the Lord would tell these stories, and the reason He told it, Luke 18, verse 9. The Pharisee and publican. And by the way, it's, there's two, what I see as a Christian, you're either growing like a, a Pharisee, or you're growing like a Christian. A Christian is one who's Christ-like. You know, many times in a the workplace they'll say, hey, if that's a Christian, <laughs> I don't want to be that. How do you know outside? It says, uh, many times in Paul's letters he'd say, how are you known uh, without? How are you known in the, in the world? How do people see you? People need to see the gospel today. There's enough here that people need to... Missouri, I'm going to show me state. Show me the gospel. I've said before, many, many... It's better to see a thing once than to hear about it a thousand times. We need to see the gospel. But here's two that went to church and Paul is... Or, uh, Jesus is talking here. The reason he says this in verse 9 of chapter 18. And he spoke this parable unto, this, un, unto certain which trusted in themselves all... Oh. I'm a Christian, I'm saved. Boy, you're a low life. You're, you're not a Christian. You know, oh, we can be so much like a Pharisee. The reason he's telling this parable is because of those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And by the way, going back to getting pulled over on the way to the airport, I got a ticket, by the way, and when we pulled out of there, down in Beaver, that's 55 mile an hour down in the Beaver on, on Route 376. I got pulled over Put your hands up on the wheel. Twice he said that. And when I was pulling out, I, I wanted to save myself. I want to tell him, guys, hey guys, let's keep this between us. You know, our flesh. Our flesh is so wicked. You know, your greatest battle is not Satan or out here. Your greatest battle is you. The Lord wants to separate you from you. Salvation is God putting his heart in yours. So I, I almost I came real close to saying, hey guys, don't say that. The Holy Spirit said, no way. No way. I said, okay, Lord, this is a day. We, we sing that song. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. That's a wonderful tune. Well, that's a day. That's a day the Lord made for me. And He wants me to rejoice in that because He wants to co-work together. He wants me to co-work together with Him in this gospel. He wants to make and mold and shape me like Jesus. 
Well, how's he going to do that? He's got to take me through some situations. He's got to take me through some things. Lord, give me some daily bread today. Lord, Father, you know, we get up in the morning. Lord, give us, Lord, our daily bread. You know, somebody cuts off on the way. To, we're going to work and... Burr, burr, burr. The Lord wants to feed you. you know, he'll bring enemies your way to try to feed you. David brought a, God brought an enemy in David's life, Shimei, kicking dirt, throwing, cursing him. David says, I see the Lord in this. I see the Lord. You're bringing this, Lord. You're going to reward me for what I'm taking here. Do you see all circumstances, situations from the hand of God that we see in the second cause? So the reason this story is, is told here is because of some who really thought, you know, they're pretty, pretty good. They're righteous. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other one a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. You ever talk to yourself? He's praying this with himself. So two, two churchgoers here. One comes in and says, Oh, this, this Pharisee says, Lord, he's thinking to himself, Oh Lord, I I just thank you so much. I'm not like that guy. He's compared it. Unbroken, proud people will compare themselves with others. Lord, thank you so much that I'm not like that sinner over there. Now a broken, roof-off Christian will say, Lord, they're aware of their own spiritual need. <laughs> Lord, help me. <coughs> so he says, I, I thank you I'm not like that sinner over there. He, you know, I tithe, I fast, I do all these things. Publican standing afar off, and he's broken. Roof off. I mean, he's broken. He doesn't care who sees it. Walls are down. He beats his chest. He says, Lord, be merciful to me, I'm a sinner. Blessed are the poor and needy, for theirs is the kingdom of God. That word needy means a pauper. It means a beggarly. It means utterly despair, destitute. You can't even get yourself out of the gutter, so to speak. You need, you have no resources to make it. You're totally dependent on another. You're beggar. Lord, help me. Help me get through this day. Is this your attitude? Help me, Lord. I can't make it. I need you. I need thee every hour. Oh, you know. You, know, you realize you need Him every minute. He, 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 this, this publican here, when he's broken, you, you realize, Lord, He doesn't care what others think. He beats his breast. He said, Lord, be merciful while I'm a sinner. He's aware of his sinful nature. He's aware of his heart condition. Proud people, oh, that's, that's that, that guy there's a sinner. That guy, oh, he's raising his hand. I, what are you worried about him raising his hand? Look to the Lord for you in your heart. God looks at hearts tonight. He's not looking at hands raised. He looks at the heart. Two people in church. One was proud. Uh, I'm born again. Say it, brother. And yet the other, he's looking around. He compared himself with somebody else. I tell you that this man went down, Jesus is teaching here, this man went down justified. You think God, what, what sin, sin uh, uh, church goer here was justified before God? The one said, Lord, I'm, I'm sinful, I need you. Let, let the Lord be justified in his sayings to you. Don't justify yourself like Jonah. I do well to be angry. You're not changing me. But he, he should justify God in his sayings. What was the sayings? Jonah, I love you. Repent. I love the Ninevites. Justify him in his sayings. Let God be true and every man be a liar. What God speaks. In Psalm 51, David says, you know, talks about justifying the Lord in his sayings. That's what he's talking about. Not in judgment day whenever you die and stand before him. You know, I like Psalm 119, I think it's maybe 164. It says, seven times a day I thank you for your righteous judgments. Usually we're not, you know, when the Lord shows us how, well, I could end this towards Mike, maybe in some way. And the Lord shows me that you're envying him. And I say, no, I don't. No, I don't. I'm justifying myself. But if I say, thank you, Lord, that you showed me, I'm envying that man. Or he's envying me. Wow, look at the teacher. Oh, I, I can't be like that. He preaches him. I can't be like that. The Lord comes to him and says, you're envying him. And he says, no, I'm not envying him. You know, this is just between you and the Lord. You're in that battle. But if he says, oh, Lord, yeah, thank you, Lord. Yeah, I confess my sin before. You, you are right. I, I praise you seven times a day because of your righteous judgments, Lord. That usually that's not our reaction. 
Usually we're justified ourselves. But this is a, a, a writer that wants to know the Lord. He wants to draw near God. And he cries out. He said, thank you, Lord. Seven times a day I'll praise you because you're showing me me. I can't confess it unless I see it. I heard the Holy Spirit referred to as the hound dog of heaven. He's hounding you. He's wanting to work in your life. Pay attention to what's going on in your heart. Not somebody else's tonight. Your heart. What's he saying to you? Everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and everyone that humbles himself shall be exalted. You want to be exalted in the Lord? Humble yourself. You exalt yourself, and he, you know, he wants to bring you to a place of humility. Let's go to two people. There was a dinner here. We went, we, two went to church. Let's go to two at the dinner here. Luke 7. <laughs> Luke 7. You know, when we are proud, we're focused on me. I'm so glad I tithe. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm not like you. Me, myself, and I. Where the, where the focus of this this broken man, this humble one at church said, Lord, his focus was the Lord. Be merciful to me. His focus was not himself. How great I am. I told you that word joy, Jesus, others, and you. I can't help it, but that's a great... I learned that in Sunday school class years ago, and it's so true. J for Jesus, O for others, and you last. You have joy. You wonder why your life's a wreck and you're a train wreck. We're out of order. The Lord's not condemning you. He says, come. Come. Come to me. I'm, I'm meek and lowly. You'll find rest. I'm what you need. Not religion. Not to walk around holy, holy, better than now. I love you. I've loved you since the time you were a kid. I've been trying to get your attention. I love you. Here's two that was at a dinner here. Jesus uh, in Luke chapter 7, verse 36, and one of the Pharisees desired him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. <laughs> and behold, a woman in the city, and it doesn't say a harlot here, but I believe it's referring to a harlot. A, a, she was a sinner in the city there. When she knew that Jesus was at, uh, eating at the Pharisee's house, she bought an alabaster box of ointment, stood at his feet, not his head, his feet, behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, kissed his feet, anointed them with ointment. Now when a Pharisee, he, can you imagine, you know, proud people kind of cross their arms a lot. It has nothing to do with physical posture. You know, boy, aren't I pretty good. You know, looking around and, you know, the Bible says esteem others better than yourself. A proud person esteems himself. Look at me. This woman's coming in the center, and I can imagine Simon's over there. It doesn't say that, but bear with me. Simon's over here like this. Can you imagine she even came in on my dinner party? Can you imagine that sinner? She's got a reputation. And then he thinks to himself, he says, if, she, if, this, if this was a prophet, he, he would know who's touching her. Oh! You know the Lord knows what you're thinking right now. He knows your motives. He knows your thought process. Psalm 139, I know your thoughts from afar. He knows your motive. I told you about people's motives and how the Lord showed me. He takes my impure motive. I remember walking to the airport one day and they, they want to give you some cookies. And their motive is not to give you cookies. Your motive is to sell their cookbooks or Costco's or Sam's. Here, here, have a little sample here. They're not doing it for your benefit. Their motive is incorrect. Or their motive is, you know, we're easily seduced. But the guy that saw me at the airport said, Glenn, you're having a... He called my wife. I think Glenn was having a bad day. He's a pilot. And I thought, well, I was pretty touching. He was good, you know, he, he saw me. Maybe I wasn't having to eat. He said, Glenn didn't have a usual smile on his face. Called me up a couple nights after that, shows up, and he's got a tape in his hand. He's trying to sell something. And I couldn't believe it. I thought I, I know I look stupid, but I, I, I have D for dumb on my forehead. I didn't, and, you know, I, I probably should have addressed it, but I didn't, you know. Yeah, he didn't care anything about me. He wanted to get my house. His motive was incorrect. I pray the Lord will show you when your motive is in the Or I'd go to Old Bon Payne, you know, get a veggie sandwich, Randy, up there at the airport. And I'd act extra nice to get a little red pepper on it. And the Lord says, I see that. I said, Lord, I'm sorry. 
<clears throat> you pay attention to the Lord, and you know He'll show you some things. You know that's one of the quickest prayers He'll answer. Lord, show me where I'm unlike you. I guarantee that'll be one of the quickest prayers that He'll ever answer in your life. And don't be, don't shrink back when He shows you. Don't shrink back. He'll have no pleasure if you shrink back because His pleasure is to give you the kingdom. His character. Don't shrink back, but keep believing in the saving of the soul. I couldn't believe that guy. He came and I said, don't tell me this is, you know, even uh, selling something. I said, no, I'm not interested, but thank you. And he went to my church. He was a Christian. My greatest, and I'll say this, my greatest <laughs> battle in 30, 32 years following the Lord has not been the unbelieving world. I've run up against a lot of Pharisees, and he's still working in me. You know, he's still working in me. I've not arrived. But when I, she shows me where I'm unlike him, I just agree. Yes, Lord. Can two walk together? Let's say be in agreement. You can't walk. If you're, if you're proud and he's, he's humble, you can't walk together with him. Just keep agreeing with him. Can two walk together? Let's say be in agreement. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And you keep walking. And he's changing you like Enoch. All Enoch did was walk with God. That's all he did. Never preached, taught, went on a mission trip, never played the guitar in any homes. Old folks home. All he did was walk with God. It's all that's necessary. You walk with Him. All that's required. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God. That's all. Pay attention to your heart. This man was a prophet. He would know who's touching. What kind of woman she is. And Jesus said, Simon, let me tell you a story. Well, tell me, Master, tell me. He had no clue what was coming. Well, the guy was settling his books. It was the end of the year. One guy owed him a bunch of money. The other guy only, only owed 50 bucks. And he forgave both of them. You're both forgiven. Which one, Simon, do you think would love me more? See, he's always trying to reveal your hearts to you. Tonight, I hope you just, just didn't come to hear a message. He's trying to reveal your hearts to you. That's what the Spirit of God does. So he tells this story to Simon to get in at, in at his heart. The heart is the matter, the issue here. It's all a matter of the heart. This woman here is crying, and you know, I've lived with two women, and she's taking the most physical thing on her physical on her on a woman's body is her hair. And she takes it with her tears and she's wiping Jesus' feet with her hair. She loves Jesus. She's thankful. She's forgiven him much. She loves much. Simon says, when I come into your house here, you didn't kiss me, you didn't wash my feet, you didn't do it. She's at my feet. She's doing all this. She's open. She didn't care who saw it. She didn't care what others thought. A broken person, a humble person, doesn't care what others think. Well, what are they going to think if I wear this? You know, what are they going to do if I... A humble person doesn't care what others think. They're focused on what God thinks. Both of them were both of them were, sin, were sinners there. But Simon, you know, hopefully he responded to the word that was coming to him. But he was proud, unbroken, stiff necked. You know, look at that sinner over there. Oh, I'm glad I'm not like that. See, in, in Christian life, we think that, you know, if someone that's out there committing adultery, physically sleeping, or murdering somebody with a gun, or oh, they're sinners. Jesus said, if you look upon a woman, and lust in your heart, you've committed a sin. If you hate anybody or have anger in your heart, that's murder. Does anybody else see their need tonight before me besides me? I need Him. Every, every, not every hour, every minute. To save me from me. Just confess. All He wants is a confession. Lord, I'll be merciful with me, a sinner. Not just a one-time thing. Not when I'm born again. He touched me. yet. Yeah. Lord, continue to touch me. It's nice to share a testimony 30 years ago when he did, but Lord, what's a new testimony? I shared last week that, you know, as you're walking on with God and he's changing you, there should be a whole, whole line of testimonies that he's continually working your life. Mm -hmm. 
she loved Jesus. And here she takes this broken, as long as she kept this, maybe, maybe she brought it, I'm just, bear with me now. She might have brought it, it might have been part of her trade. Harlotry, maybe perfume, I don't know. Maybe it was a Bible, maybe it was passed out from her grandmother and mother, I don't know this. But she's forgiven. The enemy wants to keep you paralyzed, your past. You know, when you truly repent, <coughs> from, from your past is gone. When you truly repent, forgiveness, etch a sketch. And today's a day of salvation. I'm not talking about getting initially saved unless you've never been saved. I'm talking about walking on in God. The enemy wants to keep you paralyzed. The Lord wants to set you free from you. Don't let this word condemn you. Please don't let it condemn you. Let it convict you to turn to Him and see your need. The enemy wants to, you know, if your heart condemns you, the Lord says, God's greater than your heart. Oh, Lord, you will never love me. I'm not like all these other people in church. <laughs> I tell the guys down in jail, whether you believe or not, I said, I've either done what you've done or thought what you've done here. And I know, I know, I say this publicly, if I gave myself today to certain things, and my eyes and my, my heart and focus, I'm capable of just about anything you can think of. My wife, my dear wife here, I said that 30, 25, 30 years ago in a Sunday school class. There's an older daughter Sunday school class, first one I ever taught. She's my Monday morning quarterback. On the way home, she said, you made yourself sound like a villain. And I said, by the grace of God, I am a villain. Paul said, in my flesh dwells no good thing. She's seen it now, though. Praise the Lord. She, God's growing her. I don't see no fault to her there. Paul said, at the end of his life, I'm the chiefest of sinners. <laughs> Roof off, walls down, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Paul, the great apostle Paul. Where are we at? Which one are we? Are we the, the proud, you know, looking down? Or are we the humble? Say, Lord, I need help myself. Lord, help that brother, but help me. Well, let's look at the, the two brothers. Luke 15, you know the story. These aren't familiar stories. But the Holy Spirit's always given us some fresh revelation, always wanting to speak to our hearts. The two brothers here, you know the story in uh, Luke chapter 15, verse 1, a certain man had two sons. He comes to the father and said, Lord, give me, your, give me half my portion. He didn't even wait till his father died. He said, give me, give me half my inheritance. I'm out of here. Not many days he, he took his inheritance, he went to a, far, to a far country. He spent it on a wild living. And I said, I think last week, I always thought for years the sin of the prodigal son was he spent it on wild living. The major sin there was he departed from his father, and as he walked down this path, he led him into riotous living. His major sin was he left his father in his heart. And so the outworkings were in lot of uh, harlotry and everything else. But the good thing happened, and if the parents would have sent him checks when he, when he was in the, the pigsty or went after him, this wouldn't have taken place. You need to commit your kids to the Lord. You know, any wayward kids, you follow the Lord yourself. I like the story in Judges chapter 13 where Samson is being born there. And I've encouraged, the Lord encourages me. He gives me things I have to give you. But I felt to share this too, but Judges chapter 13 where, where Samson is being born here. He's not even conceived yet. And the angel appears to the woman here and said, you're going to be with a son. Future Samson, he's, you're not to cut his hair. You're not to drink any strong drink. You're not to do this. You're, you're to obey everything I tell you to do. She runs, gets her husband. Hey, she was barren now. She runs, goes, gets her husband and says, hey, we're going to have a special child here. He, he prays. Uh, you know, for the Lord, the angel again to come back. He runs back. Uh, no, I'm sorry. The angel appears a second time to the woman. He answers the, the father's prayer, Manoah. And so the angel appears again and says, and, and you know, men were a little bit slow. In this, in this story here in Judges 13, the woman is far along spiritually. And it's not, you know, well, I'll just leave it that. But, but the... The, the man comes to her and says, or the angel says, are you the one that talked to my wife earlier? Nah, he, yes. 
Yes, I am. How do we raise this kid? Do we have Bible studies? Do I take him to Sunday school? Do I, do I take him to send him to Christian school? How do I raise him? See, in that story there, the parents' focus on a special child, how we go order this child, was on the child. But God's focus in that whole story was about the parents. You know, it, 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 it encourages me because I, you know, I, I don't have to try. Hey, did you get to church? Did you do this to my sons? And the Lord says to me, are you obeying me? You want the best parent, the best father and mother you can be is you obeying the Lord. You're being the best mother right now, Carolyn, to that daughter down in, in the service by you obeying the Lord in your life. Thank you for your continued obedience here. I told him overseas, I'm being the best wife to my husband. I'm being the best husband of my wife these three weeks not being with her. I told him over in Bulgaria. They kind of looked at me because I'm following the Lord in my life. You think this Christian life is just about you. Oh, no. I can't focus on my kids. Wait, where I have to focus on the Lord in my life. And as I follow the Lord, so God's focus in that story there was the parents the parents focus was the kid wayward you know what's going on you know I'm kind of projecting it out you know but God's focus was the parents and God's desire there was the parents would obey everything that he spoke to them that's how you're going to raise a son or child or a wayward son many older parents I see older as myself come and say you know my son's wayward. He has no desire for church. He's no, you know, my daughter doesn't have any desire for. You're to follow everything God's telling you to do. Everything. That's how you raise them. Not to focus on them. In fact, the more we beat them up, the letter kills. You know, the letter kills. You do know that. But the spirit gives life. You kill people with your words. Hit them over the head with his Bible. You follow me. The Scripture says, "You follow me." Yeah, but what about them? You follow me. You'll be the best parent. Is one who's loving me. I tell the guys down in the jail all the time. I said, you know, God's saving you from you being in jail right now. How many of you are fathers? Most of them raise their hand. And I tell them, I said, now, I hope you're not just concerned about the success of your child just in his life only. For a hundred years from now, what, 20 years from now, maybe 10 years from now, maybe a year from now, none of us are going to be here. I'm just saying, I'm making a point here. Where are we going to spend eternity? Where do you want your kids to spend eternity? That's the, that's the reason they give you kids. But we as parents, it, it, it please, when I say this, please don't look in the rearview mirror. Stay with me. If I look in the rearview mirror, I crash. Today's the day of salvation. Start new today. If God's called you here, please come here every week. It's a good start. Lord, I don't have the strength even coming. Push through that. Tell your flesh to sit down and shut up. I'm coming no matter what. I can't go on feelings. If I go on feelings, Tony, I don't know where I'll come sometime. Well, you know, I don't know when I want to come. It's cold out. You know, I can think of a thousand excuses. I'm coming. With the Lord's help. I'm, with His help, I'm coming. Pastor, I told my pastor, he said, how many you have over there? I said, well... We've had three, we've had 15. He said, who was the three? And I told him who the three was. I preached the three. I'll, I'll preach the chairs, brother. You open the church, and we'll just preach the chairs if we have to. I mean, I, you know, I want, you know, believe me, I'm encouraged tonight. I'm, I'm excited about, you know, you know, we're coming together. I, I believe it suddenly, when they were in one accord, the suddenly was the Spirit of God came into place. That's my suddenly. Suddenly, or they're giving praise and thanks in the midnight hour. And suddenly, that's my suddenly. God says, I'm coming into that place. They're giving me praise and thanks. They're going through situations. Suddenly, God's coming in that place. We're the work right here. The work's here. We're His workmanship. And don't ever think the work's out there. The work is here. Pay attention to what the Spirit of God is speaking tonight. Pay attention. Luke 15, let's continue on there, but he spent all his uh, money in verse 14. He spent all that he had. A mighty famine in the land. That was believe, uh, God designed that. He began to be in want. He spent all of his money, all of his earnings. He came to the end of himself. 
You know, the Lord's trying to bring you to the end of yourself. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. An extremity is the, the extremity of your hand is the end of your fingers here. The extremities is, is your the endings. The Lord is trying to bring us to the end of ourself so we see our need for Him. It's an opportunity for God to work in our life. So we see here that you know, he's, an he's at the end of himself there. And it says he went and joined himself to a citizen of the country. And, and, you know, he went to work for a guy and he set him to feed the pigs. He went from a, a very nice place to a pigsty. Our choices, our choices, Glenn's choices, if I follow my ways, it will lead me to a pig pen experience. It's, it's not an isolated situation. If I follow my mind, in my ways, and don't let the Lord shepherd my life and don't yield, my ways will lead me into a pig pen sooner or later. It's headed towards that way. I must yield and follow Him. Let Him shepherd my life. But so it says in, uh, so in verse 16, He would fain and He had filled His belly with husk and the wine that He did eat, the swine He did eat, and no, no man gave money. So He was hungry. He was starving. He needed fed. He came to the end of himself, verse 17. When he came to himself, the light bulb went off. Wow, I can go back to my father. He's got a heart of forgiveness. He said, my, my uh, father's hired hands, he's better than I do. Verse 18, and I like this. I will rise and go to my father and he will... He rehearsed, he rehearsed, he rehearsed his... his uh, this all the way home, I believe, he rehearsed this. Verse 18, I will rise and go to my Father and will say unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I believe he's rehearsing this all the way home. I'm going to say this to my Father. I'm going to say this. I'm no, no more worthy to be called your son. I'm merciful. Lord, be merciful to me. I don't deserve it. I'm unworthy. Lord, my, my roof's off. Walls are down. I'm broken. I'm at the end of myself. I need you, Lord, in my life. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me a hired servant. And here's the father's heart here. <laughs> and he arose and came to his father. And when he and the father's looking for him, he's looking down the road. And he doesn't stand. The father doesn't stand here like this. <laughs> the father sees his son coming back. Maybe your prodigal son. Maybe in your youth you went to church. Maybe you, in your youth you said a sinner's prayer. He, he, he's calling you to come back. He's calling you to come back. So it says, uh, his father, when he saw him a great far off, he ran and had compassion and fell on his neck and kissed him. And his son said to his father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called a son. He got that out. He repented. He confessed it. He agreed with, agreed with God in this. But the father said, bring the best robe. That word best robe means the first robe. It's like... It never happened. Bring the first robe. Put it on. The ring on his hand. The shoes on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. We're having a party. My son was dead. See, we can be Christians and be dead. Let me say that again. We can be born again Christians and be dead. Dead, dead. Jude says twice dead. Twice dead. They had not kept themselves in the love of God. The wage of sin is death. If I go my own way and follow my own path and plan, Joan experienced death in the relationship I'm talking about. I'm not talking about hell and hell. Please don't misunderstand me. So I'm going to close here in a little bit here. But uh, So he uh, put the shoes, put a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet. <coughs> Your, my son was dead. Now he's alive. Again, he was lost and he's found. Now the elder brother was in the field and he came and drew nigh the house. Hey, what's that music going on? What's, here's the righteous brother. You know, he got some of the facts, but not all the facts. An unbroken, proud person won't try to seek out all the facts and everything, but he makes a judgment call here. He hears, he hears the servant, the servant says, your son, your brother's come back and your father's giving a party. That's all he heard. What? What? He's angry. I'm not going in there. He, he spit all my dead down. The righteous brother. 
proud, arrogant. I've, I've never done anything wrong. <laughs> the father comes out and leaves a party. I heard when he left the party, that music stopped and everything, you know, back in that tradition. Left to, to go get this son here and beg him to come back. It doesn't. It, it seems like a Jonah ending here. He just seemed like, like, like this here. Son, all I have is yours. It's always been yours. They both sinned, but it's their response to the sin, the attitude. He would not, he would not repent. He would not agree. He would just... I read a book by Watchman Nee. It's called The Release of the Spirit. I encourage you. It's a little booklet. It's ta it talks about the release of the Spirit. It talks about how, how the outward man needs to be broken in our lives. Trials help do that. Sometimes a sudden blast, sometimes a gradual blast. But he wants to crack open. If that woman had had that perfume bottle, if it wouldn't have been cracked, if the fragrance wouldn't, wouldn't have went all over the place. He wants to crack the outer. The, 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 the mighty Christ comes forth in us. That's basically what Watchman Nee is saying. There needs to be a brokenness in our life. As long as Gideon's out there in that battle there, he had a uh, trumpet in one hand, he had a pitcher with a light in it. But as long as the pitcher was not cracked or, or not shattered, you couldn't see the light. But he blew the trumpet, smacked the, everybody, on the, you know, when they yelled, uh, whatever they yelled there, the sword of the Lord would get him, whatever. When they smacked, they shattered this, and the light was seen. You know, the outward shell needs to be shattered that, that the mighty Christ comes forth in us. See, the Lord wants to, I like going back to Tony's song, you know, about being used as a vessel, being used, being broken being used. It releases the Spirit of God. As long as that kernel of wheat, isn't that amazing God in nature? That kernel of wheat's got a hard shell. But it, it, unless the kernel of wheat falls in the ground and dies, it abides alone. It, it, it by just one kernel there. It's got a hard surface. But in the, in, when it's put in the ground and dies, the germination process, that shell is cracked and that, that, the grain comes out, comes out from that. From that hard shell. We look at the mighty oak tree. We, we give all the credit to the mighty oak tree. What about the mighty acorn? And God puts that seed in you, a birth from above spirit in you, that, that seed. And He wants to grow a mighty Christian in you. He wants to come forth. Watch what he said about how in, many times we imprison the Christ in us. We imprison because the outward man is not broken. We have a treasure in earth and vessel. So I'm going to close with this. This I saw this and I couldn't help it. This this uh, proud versus the uh, humble, or you could say the the uh, the unbroken being a proud person versus uh, the, the the broken humble person. The, the two categories here. I'll go through this rather quickly. A proud heart focuses on the failures of others. <laughs> Do you hear that person? How many times they were married? Do you hear that? A humble, uh, broken person is overwhelmed with his own sense of need. A proud person's fault finding, critical spirit. And again, focusing on the sins of others. The broken man, the humble man, is compassionate towards others' failures. Uh, they forgive others much because they're aware of their own forgive, need for, to be forgiven. Number three, they're self-righteous. Look down on others. Huh? What two are we? What, in these stories here, two went to church, two brothers, and you know, uh, two went to you know, two went to dinner. Which one are we in the story? And I say that not to condemn us, but want to show us our, our hearts. Self-righteous, proud or self-righteous. Look down on others. I didn't see that in probably the last ten years. Philippians says, look at others better than yourself. I thought because I'm born again. All that going to hell. And there was a, there was a proud. So I remember when my kids were delivering newspapers before church. I remember on Sunday morning, get up early, we passed the Blackhawk Golf Course, and I look over on a nice day, and I, 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 one time I said, huh, them guys need to be on church on Sunday. And as soon as I said that, whammy. The Lord spoke to me, you're saying that out of a proud heart. A proud heart. So I said, I agree with the Lord. Forgive me, Lord. They need to be in church, but so do I. 
He's, he's working on me these, these 32 years. It's, it's, it's God who worketh in you. It's up to you to work it out. you got to co-work together with them. A humble person, a broken, esteems all others better than himself. A proud person proves they're right. They get the last word. <laughs> they get the last word. I'm no doormat. A humble person, broken, willing to yield their right to be right. A proud person wants to be served. Husband and children, you meet all my needs. You meet all my needs. A humble person is motivated to serve others. It is more blessed to give than receive. Have you found that out? Another one is to be driven to be uh, recognized. A proud person is driven to be recognized and appreciated. Hurt when they're not thanked or get overlooked. You need to thank me. You need to appreciate me more. You need to appreciate me. You overlooked me. I, I deserve that appreciation. Humble person, broken, is willing to serve, no, not expecting anything in return. I hope the Lord's convicting you as He does me. I've not arrived. He's working me. <laughs> Proud persons wounded when others... Uh, Oh, I read that already. Proud person is wounded when others get noticed. Uh, broken person eager for others to get the credit. You rejoice when others are lifted up. You rejoice in that. Proud person is self-conscious. The humble person is not conscious about self at all. He's seeing the Lord. Or she's seeing the Lord. Proud person keeps others at arm's length. One thing I've always liked about this guy, ever since I've known him, he tells it pretty much the way it is. And that's there's something about honesty and humbleness before God. You like a humble person? You like an honest person? Lord, I've it's me. I had a bad day today. I maybe you know, Kurt, whatever it is. I, since I've met him, that's one thing I see in this man. But I hope he doesn't, you know, and I know he'll continue in the way. Uh, keep others at arm's length. A uh, humble man is risk getting close to others, taking a risk, love intimately. Uh, just a couple more. I was wrong. A proud person will never say, I was wrong. Can you forgive me? He has a hard time with that. A, a humble person, a contrary person is quick to admit failure, seeks forgiveness quickly. They'll run to you. I need to make this right. Or whatever it is. Whatever it is, and sometimes do whatever the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Sometimes the Lord, you don't have to go to them physically, but in your heart you need to go to the Lord. Uh, proud people wait for others to reconcile. <laughs> you're going to come to me. I'm not coming to you. You're the one that was wrong. And you, know, boy, it's, it says, what's it say in Scripture? Uh, when, when you know there's a someone has an ought against you, you go to them. Well, what do you mean I go to them? If they have ought against me, that's their problem. They're to go to me. Well, you go to them. Do we have any problem, brother? Or sister? You know, I want to get this reconciled. And again, do what the Holy Spirit speaking. A broken person is run to reconcile. Uh, uh, again, these last two here. Proud person is blind to his own heart condition. Oh, everybody else may see it, but they're blind to their own heart condition. But uh, the, the uh, broken person walks in the light. God shows them their own heart. I believe in Psalm 73. That's the problem he has in Psalm 73. He, he says, Lord, I'm, I'm, dealing, I'm plagued every morning. Here's the Christians are going out there and their, their tongue walks through the earth and they're, they're eating everything in the earth and just having a good time. No problem, no struggles. You're dealing with me. I believe that's what's going on in Psalm 73. But uh, his foot almost slipped. He said, no. Almost slipped, but I, I, I'm going to stay near you, Lord. I believe he's looking out in the earth here. Uh, the proud person can't think of any sin. Can't think of any sin. We don't, we're not specific in our sins. A, a humble person is continually need repentance. Lord, I need you continually. <laughs> I, I am a sinful person. 
I need you in my life. I need help. I, I'm honest. I'm open. I'm broken. I need you. But as long as we are stiff-armed, holding the Lord off from a distance, you know, He wants us to, He wants to, uh, us to turn to Him. And, you know, so I don't know how we want to respond to this tonight, but I don't know, maybe coming up forward, or I don't know whether anybody wants to make it, recommit their life to the Lord, or I don't know. But all I know is respond to the Lord in your seats, respond to the Lord when He's speaking to you tonight. You don't have to come up forward. This is, but respond to Him. Hearken to what He's saying. Don't run. Please don't run. You know, we the tendency is to run. Run. And the Lord says, no, no, I called you here. I love you. I have a plan and purpose for your life. But the only problem is you have a plan and purpose for your life. So that's the crux of the, the two paths here. You know, it's, may the Lord uh, continue to work in our lives. And may we just continue to respond to Him. Keep responding continually, seeing our need. And, and, and you know, I can say this, and I'll close with this. The greatest revelation I've ever had in my life is my own wicked heart before Him. How desperate my, my heart is, how much I need in my life. It keeps me from throwing stones. I used to throw a lot of stones as a young Christian. This is, Lord, this is, a, this is this touched me because I, I've been dealing with this over the years, and He's still dealing with me. I've thrown a lot of stones. Thought I was better, you know. But may we have the Lord have His way in our life. And we just repent and confess our sins, agree with Him, and continue to allow Him to have His way in our life. But He loves us. He loves us and cares for us.